Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome our students and all of our guests from the larger community here. I'm Brian McCall, the Associate Dean for Academics, and it's really an honor on behalf of Dean Harris, my colleagues on the faculty, to welcome our distinguished guests and all of you uh, to, this, to this event. Uh, in the, the great universities of Europe, in their, their origin in the Middle Ages, one of the key features of the educational program was that a couple times each semester, the students would take a break from the long lectures they would hear uh, to engage in what were called disputations, where experts would come in and address pressing issues of the day, critical questions uh, from the various perspectives of the subject matters which they taught. And this was really a highlight for the medieval students, particularly those at the University of Bologna, the first law school, uh, to take a break from their more ordered didactic studies and, and look at a particular pressing issue. And so it is really uh, in this great tradition and it is our mission as a public university and a public law school that today we can engage in a similar activity and allow not just the students in this case, but students and the wider community to come together to engage in a, a debate and a discussion of an important pressing issue for civil society. And therefore, uh, I'd like to now introduce you to my colleague, Professor Henderson, who will introduce our, our distinguished panel of guests. And is really due to the tireless effort of Professor Henderson that we have this event today. This was an idea that he conceived and worked uh, really very, very hard over the past several months to, to bring us to this point today. Um, Professor Henderson has been at the University of Oklahoma College of Law since 2011, and he recently was named as the Judge Haskell Holloman Professor of Law. He has received numerous teaching and research awards, is really one of the College of Law's most productive scholars uh, in the wide range of area, uh, wide, wide range of topics in the area of criminal law and criminal procedure. And it's really a, a, uh, an honor of, me, of mine to ex express, both on my behalf and behalf of the dean, our gratitude for his work in bringing this program here today. So, Professor Henderson. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the very generous uh, introduction. I'm actually not used to that sort of thing yet, so it was actually, <laughs> it was nice. So, um, uh, so, so thank you. And I do want to, myself as well, welcome everybody here, uh, students, wonderful faculty, staff, but I think especially members of the greater community, Norman community, Oklahoma City communities. Uh, exactly, this is exactly what we should be doing here at the law school, and so it's a pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, we have a wealth of expertise and opinions uh, here for us today, and relatively little time once we start going through it. So I'm going to very quickly uh, introduce what brings us here, and then fairly quickly turn time over to the guests that we really want to hear from. I am going to run a pretty tight ship today just because we are on a limited time, so please forgive me in advance. My students already know I can be rude and interrupt people, uh, so I apologize for that. But if I do, my only goal, I just want to make sure that every, we get a chance to hear from all perspectives on these uh, important issues. So we're here to talk about civil asset forfeiture and in particular whether we should reform Oklahoma's system of civil asset forfeiture. So a good place to start is what is civil asset forfeiture. So the 32nd version, right, is it is a civil proceeding, so it's a non-criminal proceeding, and it is brought against the property itself. So one of my favorites is an older United States Supreme Court case that is 1958 Plymouth Sedan versus the state of Pennsylvania. Right? That car has a lot of chutzpah, uh, clearly, to take on the state of Pennsylvania. But the state of Pennsylvania, of course, started it all uh, by taking on the cars. So that's what it looks like. So we'd have closer to home, right, the state of Oklahoma, essentially, versus a 2014 Honda Accord or whatever it is. And the claim would be that that car is forfeit because it was involved in criminal activity. So maybe it was used to transport illegal narcotics. Or maybe there's a sum of cash and that cash is the proceeds of a drug transaction. And so the state claims again that it is forfeit. So what happens to the car or the cash if it is subject to civil forfeiture? Well, that's something we'll learn about uh, here today. So we have four of the most important voices uh, in this discussion as it's going on here in the state of Oklahoma right now. Uh, Senator Kyle Loveless immediately uh, to my left. We have the first assistant district attorney of Oklahoma County, Scott Rowland. We have Major Bill Weaver of the Oklahoma City Police Department. And last but not least, we have the legal director of the ACLU of Oklahoma, Brady Henderson. So what I would first like to do is turn it over to each of you, uh, maybe just 30 seconds to a minute, introduce yourself and maybe what role you have uh, or what interest you have in 
civil forfeiture. So if we could start with you, Senator. Sure. Um, thank you all for coming out. It, it means a lot. I think this is a discussion that is long overdue, and uh, it's something that uh, most people don't realize what civil asset forfeiture is. And uh, I'm a state senator from South Oklahoma City. I was elected three years ago. I'll be up for re-election next, next uh, summer and fall. And so uh, I noticed that a neighboring state of ours was going through the process of civil asset forfeiture in you know, their early session. So I looked at their laws and compared our laws, and sure enough, they're pretty much the same. So uh, I looked into it and found some uh, instances that I didn't think were right, so I filed a bill. And uh, once I filed the bill, then everything's kind of gone a little haywire. I've hoped to have, uh, you know, productive discussions and continue to. And we'll hopefully, when February and March comes around, when session comes around, be able to have a product that I believe that uh, we can work together to uh, create a framework that we can uh, accomplish both goals. I'm a career prosecutor in my 21st year, 25th or 26th year in law enforcement. Uh, didn't know I was one of the most important voices in the state in anything, but I, I like that. You were just promoted. I'm going to go with it. Would you call my wife and tell her that, please? I, uh, I've never been in private practice. I spent a total of 15 years at the Oklahoma State Narcotics Bureau, 10 of that as their chief legal counsel. In that capacity, I litigated hundreds, maybe thousands, I really don't know, uh, various civil forfeiture type cases, either litigated them myself or oversaw other lawyers in litigating those. The last nine years, I have served as the second in command at the Oklahoma County DA's office, and I supervise a unit, civil unit, which does, among other things, civil asset forfeiture. So I've, a good deal of my practice over the last 21 years has involved this particular quasi-criminal area of criminal law. In addition to that, I've worked in the legislature not so much in the last nine years, but while I was at OBN, I worked out there quite a bit on various issues, many times on forfeiture-related statutes. Um, assisting in changes, asking for other changes that didn't occur, that sort of thing. I'm Bill Weaver, and I guess let me first say I'm a proud graduate of Oklahoma University College of Law. Pandering. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly enough, these big, beautiful trees out back were saplings back then, but I guess uh, times change. The other interesting thing uh, you might take note of is your Dean Emeritus, Andy Coates, was uh, actually in private practice at Crow Gunlevy back then, and I was his intern between my second and third year. So that's how things change. But uh, for the last 28 years, uh, I've been a career law enforcement officer with Oklahoma City Police Department. I'm a major, and I'm currently assigned as the commander over the Special Investigations Division. Uh, it has a myriad of units, but uh, the people that handle major narcotics violations, gangs, gang intelligence, criminal intelligence, asset forfeiture, uh, vice and counterterrorism. So uh, that, that's kind of what I do at this point. <laughs> like Major Weaver, I came through these halls as well. Uh, it's been about 10 years now that I've been an attorney. I'm also a graduate of OU Law School, and, and it's wonderful to be back. I am both a civil rights lawyer, and another way I sometimes say that uh, is that I'm a professional brake pedal on government power sometimes. And so that's, uh, that's one of the ways I now communicate that. In any case, I come at this issue not only from the perspective of being a civil rights attorney, but also a former prosecutor myself. Uh, I served several years here in the Cleveland County District Attorney's Office under both uh, Tim Kirkendall and, and Greg Mashburn. And in fact, uh, Rick Sitzman, who's back there in the audience, was my intern supervisor. When I was a legal intern, I uh, started out practicing misdemeanors many years ago. And so I've both litigated cases now in civil rights, but also uh, handled many hundreds, if not into the thousands of cases as a prosecutor as well. So like some of the other folks at the table, I've got uh, some, some multiple perspectives on the issue. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. Um, so there are a number of fascinating issues we could talk about with civil asset forfeiture, numbering in at least nine or ten, but we're going to limit ourselves to three, or at least to start with three, uh, in the interest of time. And those are, number one, whether there should be a criminal conviction trigger, number two, where the forfeit property should go, and number three, what should be the burden of proof? Meaning, to what, how certain should we be of the state's case before it can seize someone's property permanently through civil asset forfeiture? So currently, Oklahoma civil asset forfeiture, as the name would suggest, does not require any criminal conviction trigger at all. So let me start with you, Senator Lovelace, and then we'll just go down the line. If you could take a couple minutes and tell us whether that should change. Sure. Um, the bill as introduced, Senate Bill 838, requires a uh, conviction. Uh, I believe that to be the case. I think that we need to have it that way. 
Um, I think that there are some caveats that probably need to be carved out and some exceptions. And I think that there, you can take in the most vast majority of cases, like either someone is a witness or there, there's a, th a few things that's, that can probably not require a conviction, but yet the government has decided that they're not going to be pursuing it any further criminally. And so I believe that for, uh, for the vast majority, yes, a conviction is required. And um, there are several revisions to the bill and changes to the bill. When we get to the legislative session in February, we'll have a complete package of, of bills and they'll be available to people online and so forth. And so I, in, in a nutshell, yes, I think we should have a conviction requirement. Uh, I think that you can do that with some exceptions. I don't think that there should be that. I think that that obviates the, the only real addition that civil asset makes to, to drug enforcement, law enforcement in general. A bit of a history lesson illustrates that perhaps better than I can. The reason that these laws date back to 1789. They had civil interim forfeiture out of the very first Congress. But the ones we're talking about, these laws, were really brought out of the mothballs and dusted off back in the late 70s, early 80s as part of the, the escalating battle against drug trafficking. The reason, and, and what these laws do that we don't have otherwise, is they allow us to remove, rem, remediate, they remedial laws, they remove the actual instrumentalities of the crime. If you attach a requirement that there be a conviction, you simply turn it into another fine. Let me illustrate this by just jumping right into something of an absurd example. The reason you don't want to have a requirement of a conviction, that which is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a person knowingly and intentionally did X, violated this drug law, that's quite a different set of evidence than that which is required to prove that this vehicle or this, this whatever the race is, whatever the property is, this money was used to violate the law. Imagine a traffic stop where $100,000 shrink wrapped in individually wrapped compartments, welded shut in a gas tank, Stamped on the top, it says, property of Sinaloa cartel. In other words, imagine that there's a quantity of, drug, of money that none of us can disagree is drug money. It's welded shut, no other evidence that the drug courier had knowledge of it. Indeed, she may not. Many times they don't suspect they're hauling Bibles, but beyond that, they don't know exactly what they're hauling. To have a bill that requires an absolute conviction would require them to weld that compartment shut, send her happily on her way with that which no one can dispute is drug money. So to have the ability to attack only the money and it's in a separate proceeding, whether or not we can prove the ancillary, the separate crime, fills a gap that existed and was problematic until that gap was filled in the 1980s. Yeah, let me just say, uh, that's exactly right. Drug, you know, the cartels and the other drag, drug trafficking organizations are pretty smart, and uh, they're not out carrying the money and carrying the drugs. Uh, the heads of those organizations aren't any more than the president of GM that's putting the lug nuts on the wheels on the, on the assembly line. But uh, so they hire people uh, who probably know something's wrong but don't know exactly what's wrong, and they have them drive across the country carrying drugs one way and money back the other way. Uh, and that money uh, goes to fuel those cartels, and it, it puts drug houses in our neighborhoods and drug dealers on our street, and uh, if we take it, then we hurt those cartels and hurt those drug trafficking organizations, and we use it to uh, provide money and training and equipment for law enforcement. So really, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple civil procedure that's really com completely separate from uh, the criminal case. I think there are a couple of things that are that are worth addressing, and and I tend to agree with Senator Loveless. I don't. I think there can be exceptions where a conviction isn't required, and really, it's what uh, Scott said that I think is exactly the prototypical example. You've got situations where you have money that there's no real dispute is contraband. You need to be able to seize it. I will say, however, that even under a criminal conviction trigger, you could. It would actually be effectively unclaimed property. The difference and where law enforcement may have a problem is they don't get to themselves keep it as an agency. It would go into effectively a general state fund. So in fact, not only would you not send it down the road, you, you really technically couldn't because the idea that you're not charging the drug courier is based on you as law enforcement saying this person has no knowledge, therefore no right to this money. Um, but I think there's, I want to tell a very, very brief story to kind of illustrate why things like a conviction trigger are needed. But the, this, incredible power that civil asset forfeiture brings to the table can be misused. There was a case in Tulsa 
not too long ago, two gentlemen were kidnapped. And the kidnappers, during the kidnapping, also stole a bunch of their money. I believe they had come into their home, if I remember correctly, stole a couple thousand dollars that these gentlemen had. The kidnappers were caught and eventually prosecuted, and of course the couple of thousand dollars is found on them. And uh, here's where it gets a little interesting. The DA's office said, you know what, that's our money, because it's the instrumentality or proceeds of a crime. We should keep that. We don't have to give it back to you kidnapping victims. They not only fought the kidnapping victims in district court, even though there was no factual dispute that it had been stolen from them, the DA's office there ended up fighting basically to the state Supreme Court to try to get the right to take that money or to rather keep the money that had been stolen by the kidnappers rather than give it back to its rightful owners. I bring up that example simply to suggest that civil asset forfeiture is an incredible power because it gives the state the power to have practical possession of funds based on probable cause or a property and then it puts the onus on the property owner to get it back. So the potential for misdirection, unfortunately, is, is very high in those situations where you have somebody willing to abuse that power. Thank you very much. Any quick rejoinders? Are we, are we satisfied uh, so far? Let me just say this. I, I'm over the people that do that for the Oklahoma City Police Department. And in, in the last year or so, I, I've had one complaint in relation to asset forfeiture. And it was a mother who didn't know her son was a drug dealer. And, you know, uh, policemen don't forfeit people's money. They seize the money based upon probable cause. They have to present it to the appropriate prosecutor's office, who makes as a second level of decision. And then, even if no one is claiming the money, they still have to prove to the court, uh, to a preponderance of the evidence, that the money is connected to the drug trade. And basically, law enforcement has no interest, whether it's the district attorney or the police, in taking money away from innocent people. That, that's simply not true. Of course, that's right. I was not going to get into anecdotal situations today because we could be here all day with our stories. I've got war stories dating back to 88. Don't worry, not going to do it. <laughs> since, since we've gone there, Darren, I've got four minutes at the end, right? Yes. I, yes. May, I may toss out a couple then, but no, I'm, I'm not going to. Okay, terrific. <laughs> Okay, terrific. Well, thank you very much. All right, so our second issue is that currently the forfeit property goes to either the police department slash or the prosecutors that are uh, responsible for the forfeiture. So, Senator Lovell, starting with you again, should that change? Sure. Um, the original, and I, I'm going to, you're going to hear this mantra a couple of times. When I first introduced the bill, the Senate Bill 838, the money uh, used the New Mexico model, which sent the, uh, the funds to the state general fund. You know, a day after filing the bill uh, and thinking it through and talking with uh, folks at the Capitol, you know, you give it to the state Capitol, we're going to spend it. <laughs> and uh, probably not on its intended purpose. Its intended purpose is uh, to cut down the demand of drugs. So how would I go about doing that? So since then, we, the idea that we've come up with is a citizen oversight board that will be housed under the Attorney General's office that will be made up of law enforcement and lay citizens. And they will determine through, the grant, through a regular grant process, the money will be determined through in three main areas, drug treatment, drug courts, and drug interdiction. And that way, I believe, as a state, we can attack the true uh, nature of the drug uh, demand. And, and to me, that takes away the idea and the concept, and even the misconception or perception, that there are agencies and uh, folks out there doing things to grow their own agencies. Right now, there basically are two different pools of that money. There are the state agencies which can perform their own asset forfeitures, the State Narcotics Bureau, OSBI, et cetera. I believe there are five of them now or six. Those agencies can perform their own. That money goes back into their budget into a revolving fund. The other, and perhaps larger, are the individual counties, the local police departments, sheriff's offices. Whenever they bring a forfeiture, it is brought to that district attorney. If it is if it's successful and the money is acquired, it goes into a fund operated by the DA's office, and the DA's office can share it back with the local agencies according to their participation. That's just the quick down and dirty on what's going on with it right now. The, generally, it goes back into law enforcement specifically. It is spent on everything from, from equipment, and in some cases salaries, although I think that's very, very dangerous. The bottom line is this isn't going into police officers' pockets. One of the things that's really kind of gotten my hackles up at the beginning of this is this the, the term coined by some of the some of the interest groups over east of here in states east of here, pol policing for profit. And I'm shaking my head thinking there's not a single dollar of this that goes in a single police officer's pocket. 
there are agencies. We've got a, a task force in Oklahoma County which is funded entirely by the forfeited money. They work all kinds of criminal interdiction. I can't tell you how many identity theft rings they've broken up this year. They stopped these vehicles with several thousand blank credit cards in them. They get a lot of, 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 of drug money as well. So where the money goes ultimately, that, that's almost a political question. Uh, you have to keep in mind that there will be public functions that are funded by that right now that will have to be funded somehow. Our DA's office right now in Oklahoma County, we are 47 percent funded by appropriated dollars. The rest of it is made up through other sources, about 9 or 10 percent of it from forfeited money. No, we're not going to nail the door shut if that money goes into a general fund. Of course not. And there probably isn't going to be any big diminution in public safety or law enforcement. But it will have to be made up somewhere, somehow. So if you take nothing else from what I said here, the policing for, for profit thing is designed to get your ear and get your vote. There's no such thing. The money does go back into the budgets of agencies. Could there be more oversight? Could there be more wisdom in how that's spent? <laughs> I'd be shocked if that weren't the case, although I haven't personally <laughs> investigated it and found out one way or the other. Uh, in Oklahoma City, 100% uh, of the uh, of our – well, first let me say this. We have an agreement with each of the district attorney's offices that we work with. It's three or four counties. And a share of the money, if it is forfeited, comes back to the Oklahoma City Police Department. In Oklahoma City, 100% of that money is de dedicated to narcotics enforcement. In other words, we spend it on training and equipment. If we didn't do that, then one of two things would happen. Either the services to the citizens of Oklahoma City and central Oklahoma would fall, or there would have to be some way to ra raise the taxes and bring in the money to, fi to fill that void. And, you know, drug traffickers are more and more advanced each and every year, and it takes a lot of training and a lot of expensive equipment to try to keep up with that problem. So that's, that's what happens, at least here in Oklahoma City and the surrounding counties. I think my main concern with the money essentially staying with the jurisdiction that seizes, it's twofold. One is the appearance of impropriety issue, and in some cases potentially actually impropriety. But the point is that we've got folks out on th places like I-40 that are dedicated interdiction units. They're out there seizing money day in and day out. It's the main focus of what they do is to seize things from traffickers. That can create a problem when you have not only that, but combined with the fact that then you have officers making these decisions thinking, is this, do I think this is drug money? Do I think this is illegal? And those same officers have their equipment paid for, their salaries paid for by that same money then down the road. You know, one of the things that we often do in criminal justice and in civil justice is we don't just guard against actual abuse, we guard against that appearance. I think that's particularly important right now because all over America, there is an incredible problem growing with, in terms of trust between law enforcement and citizens. And I think that appearance, even when there is no fire there in the smoke in some cases, right, it can be an issue and a big one. The second thing we have that is a bit of an issue is not so much going on in the highways, it's locally. And that is a robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. We've got, we get average seizures that are instead of, you know, $100,000, or are $1,000 from somebody who's caught with a joint. Um, the problem there is they end up often stripped of that cash, they go into jail, they can't make a bond, we end up paying for their court-appointed attorney. The problem there that is created, and, and I think it's actually similar to what Scott said, it, anywhere in here there, there is sort of a political question. You end up making up the difference one way or another. But I think it's important to note that we're doing that now as well. I think any change in where the money goes is probably going to breed that same thing of having to make up the difference. I think it's just a question <coughs> of where. All right, thank you very much. So the third question then, as we said, was the burden of proof. So currently in Oklahoma, it's a preponderance of the evidence, and that's the same burden of proof as, of course, the law students know well, but maybe everybody else doesn't. It's the same burden of proof we use in civil trials. So if you sue somebody of an automobile accident, right, the state has to prove it's more likely than not, just by epsilon, just tip the scales, that the property was involved in illegality. So should that be changed? Sure, this is one of those areas that I've, I've said from the beginning you know, our founders, when they uh, created our country, you know, they equated life, liberty, and property. And when the government takes our lives, when it, you have a death penalty uh, and then also puts you in jail, it has to be a very high standard. We have to make sure. Yes, there are instances where people, innocent people, uh, get put in jail. But for the most vast, vast majority, uh, we, we, the, the standard is higher. Same thing with uh, property. 
for whatever reason, property has been designated as a lower standard. I don't believe that that's right. I believe for the government to permanently keep it, not seize it, the seizing, they can, my bill has nothing to do with the, the seizing aspect of it. If they truly believe it to be part of a crime, uh, that'll, that's, that's on law enforcement to be able to, to c collect. Mine is on the permanent, app, permanent ability of, the, of government to be able to keep your property. And I just believe that keeping it at 50% plus one is not sufficient for me. The proposal would put it at this middle ground between the preponderance of the evidence, something, I'm sorry, the uh, preponderance of the evidence versus beyond a reasonable doubt, that middle one, which is clear and convincing evidence. Honestly, when you start trying to ask someone to define the difference, you very quickly start trying to describe what nitrogen looks like. There is a difference. That burden is used, for instance, on taking professional licenses or when the state tries to remove your children from school. Um, this is a bit intriguing to me, honestly. I don't think that there are any Oklahomans' rights violated now that would not be violated if you raise the burden of proof. I do not believe the increment is that precise here. I'm sure we'll get to this later on. I do not believe that there is widespread systemic abuse of Oklahomans' rights right now. I sure hope not. I've looked for it since this all began, haven't seen any systemic abuse yet. But to raise that burden of proof, I don't think would do anything to protect them. So then why not just do it? Here's why, two reasons. Number one, we have about half of our forfeiture statutes in Oklahoma already require clear and convincing evidence. I've never heard anybody say that that protects rights more. I've never frankly heard anyone draw the distinction one way or the other. I remember when that law was passed, it was about 15 years ago. I think they just put it in there because it seemed better than it was drafted 15 years after the prior one had been done. For government to take do the ultimate taking under, the, under, the, under eminent domain, that's preponderance of the evidence. So I'll go back to my question, why not do it if it'll make Senator Loveless and others feel like rights are more protected? Because this is a zero-sum game. We have to remember there's somebody on the other end of this money. I don't know if you know it or not, there's a war going on in Mexico. Since 2006, 30, 35,000 people have been killed in nar narco-trafficking wars. Those are fueled in large part by the money that comes through America. Lots of it comes through Oklahoma. Not trying to be hyperbolic or trying to scare you up. Them's the facts, ma'am. And so anything we do that makes it a little more difficult to get that money makes it a little bit easier on them. So I submit to you, and what we're really trying to do is give you guys information to figure out what you think here. Before you figure that out, ask yourself if there's not a good reason to slide that up and make it more difficult, maybe, to take the money. Why do that? Why do anything at all that is going to give any quarter, harbor, or aid to the most violent criminal organizations that have ever been known to the Western world. And that's what I'm talking about that's south of the border right now. Sorry I preached. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I did. I sure am glad Scott's on my side. <laughs> well, let me say this. This is just a civil case. It has the same standard as most civil cases. I honestly do not believe that there is any problem with misuse of asset forfeitures in Oklahoma. Are there anecdotal cases? Sure, you've got, you're involving human beings here. There's a mistake somewhere, but there's a wealth of ways to address that. Modern police departments spend more time, or, or well, not more time, but a significant amount of time investigating ourselves to make sure everything's done right than you could, than you could ever believe. It's a, it's a huge part of my job and, and the other people at my level, what they do. So, and, and the truth is, the question then becomes, Scott's exactly right, why would you want to do anything to hurt law enforcement and help the drug traffickers? Part of the problem here is that we've got a couple of different things going on. We've got seizures that are from drug traffickers, but we're not prosecuting the people carrying them because they don't know anything. We've got seizures then who are from common Oklahomans, who in some cases may be innocent, maybe in some cases they're guilty. The standard of proof, I think, matters from a perspective of how we design government, the notion of checks and balances. I mean, remember, all of this is based on giving the government a power that normally it would not have. And I believe as citizens, we have a duty to circumscribe that power carefully. But frankly, I, I tend to agree a little bit with, with Scott in, in something here, and that's I don't think the burden of proof would make a big practical difference in a lot of cases. I think what would make a bigger difference is actually what we call a fee shift. 
because if you are an innocent victim of asset forfeiture, and they are out there, I'm not saying it's widespread, I'm not saying it's everybody, not even close, but if it's me, it matters. If it's your mom, it matters. If it's your brother, it matters. Right now, if I am subject to a forfeiture proceeding, the chances, the probability that I will come out whole, as we say in torts class, right, that I will be on the same plane I started, is 0, 0.00 times 0 to the zeroth power, right? <laughs> It is exactly nothing, because there is no way that I can ever recoup my attorney's fees or my costs in doing that. It's simply guaranteed in the system. I think something that's at least as big a deal as burden of proof, probably more, is simply putting a fee shift in there. Let me have a way, if I am an innocent victim, right, if I'm not a drug trafficker, if I'm somebody who gets caught up in a, anything from a wrong house raid to, I kid you not, this happens when somebody gets pulled over and they have a lot of cash because they just want a poker tournament. I mean, it... These things happen, you know. It, being prosecutors like, like Scott and I've been, being an officer, you know you can't make this stuff up. Um, there are amazing things that happen day to day. Point is, in those situations, have an ability for people to be made whole. What that will also do is tell us whether or not there really are more widespread abuses, because right now if I have $1,000 taken from me and it costs me 5000 with an attorney to get it back, I'm never going to contest it. I think that's a problem where we may not know exactly how many of these cases are legitimate and aren't. We're going to turn to the next portion, but if I could, Mr. Rowland, would you be willing, would you have any problem with a fee shift or just because that might be an interesting proposal that maybe you could change it to? Don't know. It doesn't send me screaming into the night. Okay. Um, but, but, <laughs> but again. I'll go with that. <laughs> again, uh, whenever we get to, the, to, to my yes. more open time, we'll in the moment, right I'll, I'll yeah. give you a few of these examples. What I see out there. I don't see any Oklahomans, and I, I love Brady Henderson like a brother. But this thing about the kidnapping in Tulsa, which I've never heard about before, I'm going to go investigate. I invite you all to email me and let me share with you what I find out. I've got a feeling that there is more to that story. And so what I mean to say is I don't see a lot of innocent people being caught up in it. So my gut is it wouldn't wind up costing a lot of the money, but right. uh, fair is fair. Maybe you could design something like that. Never really thought about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So what we do now want to do is open up for a little bit more time uh, for each of our guests. So to talk about anything that has come up or anything that has not come up, or if you want to cede some of your time, so you have a, you know, up to about four minutes. If you want to cede some of your time, we'll uh, turn it over to audience questions as well. But let me start with you, Senator. Sure. Let me give you a little background. When I started, uh, when I introduced the bill, I met with uh, law enforcement, and first I was told, uh, you know, the, the, the system is perfect, and uh, we, there have not been any cases of innocent people stuff being taken. Um, then I was told, well, um, we use the money 100% for law enforcement, and if you take it away from us, we'll, 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 we won't be able to do what we need to do, and we'll have to lay off people. Um, neither of those have been true. We have, there are innocent people. There are cases, the funny thing is, well, don't tell us anecdotal stories. There are cases out there. Oklahoma Watch did a story. Channel 4 did a story. Channel 6 in, in, in Tulsa did a story. The, the media has done a good job of getting the word out there of stories. Uh, the best one that I have is a, a, chief, a chief of police from Apache, Oklahoma. Um, he also, on his side, has a ranch. Well, in his side business, let somebody use his truck. That guy got pulled over for something. They seized his truck. Uh, he had to go to court, and it took him nine and a half months to get his truck back, and it was, he was completely innocent in the deal. And he's the chief of police. So if the chief of police has to go through legal hoops and do all these other things, th then the system is not right. We have cases here in Norman where a kid was pulled over after working a couple weeks at Sonic because he had a marijuana bus <coughs> when he was 13. He was now 18. They seized his money from his check after he had it cashed. He had the pay stub with him. The preeminent case in Oklahoma is uh, Greg Mashburn versus $18,007. It was a, car, a couple driving through Oklahoma and pulled over, no pot. The police officer said they smelled like pot. Well, they got a dog. Come to find out it wasn't a drug dog. It was the guy's personal dog. And uh, they took the $18,000. Uh, that they were going to buy a used car in. And it's a case, Mashburn versus $18,007. But where's the $7 come from? The guy's wallet. They took money out of his wallet, didn't give him a ticket, and let him go, let them go. So the, the question remains, the cases are out there. It's not just anecdotal. Is it widespread? Are there bad cases uh, like other states? Probably not. And, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't happen here. As Martin Luther King told us in his letter to Birmingham, in, 
the Birmingham jail, if an injustice to one of us is an injustice to all of us. So if one, of, if one innocent person gets taken, then it, I think the system needs to be looked at and changed. I have never heard anybody in any government position s des describe any government des system as perfect. I'm surprised to hear anybody ever told you asset forfeiture was perfect. There is nothing perfect about anything that I do any part of the day. And, and I'm not being facetious here. No way is it perfect. Uh, apparently no way are our deadly force laws perfect across the country. We have officers who are in jail on various degrees of murder right now. Do you want to repeal the laws allowing the use of deadly force? To throw the baby out with the bathwater because you can come up with some instances of abuse, again, that goes back to helping the criminal drug trafficking organizations. Got an email this morning when I walked in. Now I'll get to a few anecdotes um, since we've got a little bit of extra time. First email I got this morning, a stop last night by our interdiction unit. Two guys came here from Ohio, no luggage, um, no real explanation, dog hits on the car, there is $57,000 shrink wrapped in plastic in a hidden compartment. Neither one of them knows anything about it at all. Probably straight up drug couriers. Right now we let them go, seize the money based on probable cause and we'll investigate to see whether or not there's enough to go forward on the money or enough to charge them. Back about seven months ago, one of our civil lawyers walked into my office and I'll make this quick. She said, we've got a pending forfeiture case. I don't remember how much it was. It was more than $10,000 and less than 30, I believe. And they had come to an agreement. It was filed and the lawyers wanted to settle the case. They'd come to an agreement and she said the problem is the lab report came back and the marijuana that the guy had wasn't. Apparently he was selling turkey dope. And I said, dismiss it. And she said, well, we, you know, we've, we've got the judgment all drawn up and it's doing all this. And the, 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 just want to dismiss it. And I said, absolutely. Call them and tell them it turned out not to be dope. They can take the money and they can fight over it. The two of them or the three of those lawyers. Uh, back in August, a vehicle stopped going westbound by our unit. There was $28,000 in the car, two male occupants. They said that they were headed westbound. The money was in cash and it was in a hidden compartment. Okay, if you've got a haul cash, you may want to hide it to keep from getting robbed. Said they were going out west, that they were rap artists, and they were going to go make CDs or buy CDs or something. Suspicious as it can be, not probable cause. Our, our unit sent them on their way. Three days later, a different officer stopped on coming back eastbound. Now instead of $28,000 or whatever it was, they've got about $2,000 and about $26,000 worth of cocaine. <laughs> and so take them down to the station to interview them, ask one of them for their ID, and he says, I've left it at home. And our officer said, well, you had it three days ago when we stopped you on your way out. And he said, I want a lawyer. <laughs> That's what we're seeing. The majority of the cash seizures on the highway, at least in my jurisdiction, the people claim no knowledge of it. They waive their interest in it. They want nothing to do with it. They're told to do that. They're told if you get stopped, let the money go. The last thing we want is law enforcement working both ends of this thing where the money came from, where it's going, poking around here, snooping to see who's on either end of it. And so if I had to summarize my position here today, I would tell you, no, it's not perfect. There is no area, traffic enforcement's not perfect. Tiff and I were in traffic court three or four weeks ago, and you'd be surprised at the number of innocent people who got clocked on radar speeding. Probably some of them were, I don't know. None of it's perfect. The question isn't whether it's perfect. The question isn't, should we be seizing the property of innocent people? Of course the answer to that is no. That's like saying the question in education is whether we ought to teach our children to read. The question is this, knowing what we know, about criminal organizations, about the role of this money in those, about the role of Oklahoma's highways involuntarily in all that, knowing what we know. Is there abuse to the degree that we should scrap the current laws, knowing that it will in some measure, great or slight, benefit the criminal organizations? Is there sufficient evidence out there to warrant that? I submit to you, no. I submit to you when you find these abuses, if they're breaking the law, prosecute them. If they're not adequately trained, fire them or train them. But to throw the baby out with the bathwater, I think, is ill-advised and maybe a bit lazy on all of our parts as voters and policymakers. Thank you. You know, the mission of the Oklahoma City Police Department and, and most modern police departments today is to try to provide safe neighborhoods and safe streets. 
and maybe you don't have an experience with the neighborhoods where there's drug houses and there's violence and there's gangs, but lots of people do. Now, drugs, there's no doubt, is a root cause of a significant percentage of not only violent crime, but nonviolent property crime as well. So basically, the drug, the drug business is all built on greed and money. And the money that's, that comes out of that drug business is used to facilitate and expand the business. And the truth is, it, pull, it pulls millions and millions of dollars out of the US economy that goes back to Mexico. So Senate Bill 838, I, I don't see any justification for, nobody's shown me anything that would justify making it harder and having a negative impact on law enforcement and providing a benefit to the people that traffic drugs. Um, you know, th we've been over and over the safeguards, and, and there's, lot, there's lots of them. There's due process. It's, it's met constitutional muster for years. Uh, so, so the idea of changing it now on this anecdotal evidence, to me, uh, simply makes no sense. Uh, and the last thing, and I'm just going to take an opportunity to slip this in, it, you know, there is a problem uh, in some parts of the country with trust, and Brady bought this up, but I've been in this business one way or another since 1981, and I wear a uniform one or two days a week, and I can tell you that in the, this last year, I've never had more citizens come up to me and thank me for my service as an Oklahoma City police officer than I have in these last years. And, and the, the department and me personally are, of course, eternally grateful for that support because we can't do our job without, uh, you know, the support uh, of the citizens we serve. So anyway, thank you. I, I particularly appreciate what Major Weaver just said because I think it's very important. Part of my concern with seeing how civil asset forfeiture works, well, it's twofold. One is, I think there's a risk out there, and you see it more on I-40 than you do in Oklahoma City. I'm not really talking about what's going on locally so much as an in interstate interdiction. But you've got a risk of effectively turning cops into collections agents, and that's a problem. That, that's not what police are there to do. Police are there to keep us safe. They're there to do justice. They're there to build strong and safe communities. They're there to serve these higher purposes. This is something that I think is uncomfortable to say, but I think it needs to be said. And, and it's in response to the notion that if we reform civil asset forfeiture, we risk creating a system that benefits the criminals, benefits the cartels. I would submit that we already have that system. There are numerous people out there who will talk about big seizures. Here's where we seized half a million dollars. Here's where we seized, seized 50 pounds of marijuana. What I have never, ever seen is the evidence that says, here's the drug cartel that went out of business because of it. Here is the local area whose drug supply was actually cut off. When we're talking about cartels, we're talking about essentially the equivalent of not just Fortune 500 companies, but Fortune 100 companies. These are incredibly big and sophisticated multinational corporations. I can guarantee you we're not going to take them down taking a few dollars out of a car every little bit. We're going to take them down by going after the actual people or by changing how we do drug policy as a whole. There is a sheriff that I once spoke to about this who asked to remain nameless, but it suffices to say this. I once asked him, you know what, you're out there, you seize this $100,000, you know it's headed to a stash house in L.A. or a stash house in near the Mexican border of Texas, and, wouldn't, and you know that the mules carrying it know nothing. Wouldn't you like to get to that stash house? Instead of seizing the money, follow it down there raid that stash house, nail the lieutenant, and then see if the lieutenant will give up a contact in Mexico and start actually taking down this organization. And the sheriff, who very much asked to remain nameless, said, of course I would, but I neither have the resources to do that, and plus, here's what else would happen. There might be $20 million in that stash house, but I'd never see a piece of it. I need to go seize that 100000 There's a larger problem with funding of law enforcement that, that nothing we're talking about fixes. Um, that's a bigger issue. There's a larger problem with whether we're actually trying to win the drug war or whether we have just tried to preserve the stalemate. There is effectively a symbiotic relationship that's developed. If I'm a drug cartel, I send these mules down the road, I get a little bit of product and a little bit of money taken, maybe equivalent to 5-10%, which is about a corporate taxation rate. It's the cost of doing business. We're not going to take these guys down doing that. Anytime you have 
a grant of power to the government like civil <coughs> asset forfeiture, there has to be something in return. And I think one of the biggest problems with civil asset forfeiture is that we're really not getting the improvements in public safety in return that I think are out there. There are better ways to deal with this. Civil asset forfeiture has become something on which we are dependent. But I think we've forgotten to look at that next level and say, wait a minute, is this actually something that's going to go win the drug war? Is this actually something that's taking down these organizations? Or is it something that's just preserving a status quo? In some ways, that status quo is not so bad. We don't have the level of violence seen in Mexico. We have a certain predictability to things. But in other ways, that status quo is horrifying. And I think it's, it's what Major Weaver said as the example. You go into some neighborhoods and they're Swiss cheese. The daddies are in prison. Uh, you got too many mommies on drugs. You got neighborhoods riddled with violence, riddled with gangs. Civil asset forfeiture, I would submit to you, is not the magic bullet for that. And, and I'm not saying anyone's saying it is. Just that it's important to understand that when we have these kinds of policy debates, it's not a matter of one side saying, I want to help the criminals, and the other side saying, I want to help the cops. It's a lot more complicated. And that's a reality that we're going to have to face long after the debate about uh, Senate Bill 838 uh, is over. Well, thank you very much. I can tell you these are four law-abiding citizens because I never once had to be rude. They actually abide to all the rules <laughs> that we set. So that, that's impressive. 